Greetings. Uh, this evening I'm going to be talking to you about the uh, North Star Advantage. I'll give a quick overview of, of this machine already, but uh, I think it, it's uh, an interesting machine. It was not very popular in its day, but uh, it's, a, uh, it's a fairly advanced model, and uh, I don't think it really has gotten the attention that it's deserved. Um, it was eclipsed by the, the IBM PC due to uh, when, they were, when it was released. Uh, CPM and 8-bit uh, machines like this were, were quickly fading into the background. Um, but uh, it was a, a high-quality model, and uh, I think it deserves more attention than it's gotten. So uh, this came out in 1982, um, and uh, in 82 nobody had any idea what was going on. Uh, the PC had just been released in late 81. Um, CPM was still dominant, and uh, everything was pretty much in flux. You had, for business machines like this, you had uh, the Apple III, you had the Osborne Portable, which was CPM, um, you had, on the high end, you had Chromemco machines, uh, which were kind of working North Star's corner in, in a way. Um, you also had the first round of clone machines, the, uh, the Eagle PC and the Columbia Data Products PC, which were, uh, as it turned out, uh, rather actionable clones of the PC, uh, which put them both out of business. Um, and uh, on, top of the, on top of the hardware chaos, there was also operating system chaos. Uh, you had machines that had uh, very basic disk operating systems, which were really just just uh, disk routines that were tied into the ROM basic on some machines like Apple IIs and Apple IIIs. Um, you also had uh, a whole host of machines that were supported by CPM, um, which was basically all of the 8-bit business machines could run some form of CPM. Um, and there was a, a great deal of disparity on, on what a CPM machine actually was. Um, you had, uh, there was no standard bus for any of this stuff except for the S100 bus, which was used in a lot of uh, 8080 and Z80 machines, um, which a lot of those were CPM machines. Um, and then you had, uh, uh, well, Chromemco had Chromix, you could get Xenix. Um, with IBM, you could get PC DOS or, or CPM86, neither of which were compatible with anything else. Um, <clears throat> and then you had uh, computer companies like Northstar, which also came out with their own proprietary operating systems. And in Northstar's case, they came out with a, an operating system called NS DOS. Uh, no points for figuring out what that stands for. Um, this was also a time when home computers were starting to separate away from personal computers. So while this is a personal computer, uh, the home computers were much cheaper and tinier things. The uh, Commodore 64 came out, um, also in 82, I believe, and uh, it was um, more powerful than business machines for, for graphics and sound, um, but it was a fairly chintzy a little cheap little piece of equipment. So um, if you were trying to do productivity type stuff, you would still want to go with a business machine. Um, so, so Northstar was kind of an interesting computer company anyway. Uh, they got their start as a, a company called Kentucky Fried Computers um, until the, the kernel decided that that was uh, an inappropriate name for a computer company. Um, so they changed their name to Northstar, but they got their start in the, the S100 bus community. So the S100 bus was just, uh, as it was uh, uh, started by the Altair 8800 and, and later the MSI 8080. Um, it was a basic, a very basic bus standard for 8080 and Z80 based um, machines. Um, with some level of inter interoperability, you could you could get a stack of cards together and put them all in a box and uh, and um, make a machine out of that. So Northstar started doing that. They they first came out with a, a floppy disk controller, uh, which was their big thing. They had a, they had the best 
best price and best quality floppy disk controller um, in their day. They also got uh, a Z80 processor card, a floating point board of their own design, um, memory cards, that sort of thing, and eventually they got around to uh, building an entire computer, which was called the Horizon. The Horizon uh, was a full-size desktop machine. Um, it was one of the early ones, if not the earliest one, to ship with, with an actual floppy disk drive bay. Um, and, uh, of course, which made sense since North Star's main business was uh, floppy controllers. It was also kind of a turnkey um, type of machine where you could plug it in, um, plug it into the wall, plug it into a serial terminal, and uh, be able to go from there without having to flip switches on the front panel or, or that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so that was kind of their market segment. They were, they were going for more of the business end. And uh, as things progressed, they got the money together and designed this guy, um, which was, as you can see, a, a fully integrated machine. And for, for most applications, all you would have is this box and two wires coming out of the back of it, one going to the wall and one going to a printer. Um, and that was, that was a pretty much a complete business system. It's also fairly compact. It's not, uh, it's not like a, uh, a Horizon, which would be the same footprint, and you would have a serial terminal on top of that. Um, so, and that was another big difference between home computers and, and uh, personal computers. A lot of, uh, like the S100 bus machines, those mostly had used serial terminals, um, whereas home computers used um, integrated video. And this is, this is uh, sort of halfway in between. It is, uh, from a technical perspective, it is fully integrated. Um, from a speed from a speed perspective, it's more like a 9600 BPS serial terminal. Um, so the machine itself, um, aside from the from the visual simplicity and the fact that you didn't have to uh, plug too terribly much into it, um, it is a ZADA, four megahertz machine. 64 kilobytes of parity uh, main memory, 20 kilobytes of non-parity video memory, um, and 2 kilobytes of boot PROM. So very basic uh, boot ROM, um, not too terribly much in there. There's also an 8035 um, keyboard and kind of keyboard and system controller, I would say. Uh, the 8035 scanned the keyboard, um, and uh, held the uh, held the type ahead buffer. It also did some other miscellaneous functions. It it uh, managed the the standard system beep and also uh, counted sectors on the floppy disk. Um, and uh, they had because this has more than sixty four kilobytes of memory in it. They also came up with a, a four bank bank swapping system. So uh, sixteen case chunks the the processor could only address 64K. So they divided it into um, six, four segments of 16K, and you could switch that out into a two, 256K address space. So it was effectively an 18-bit address space. That way the processor could directly um, access the video memory and it could directly access the, uh, the boot ROM and still provide a full 64K for, for system and applications. Um, the video itself, uh, this is a 12-inch green screen. Um, it appears to uh, CPM programs as an 80 by 24 text mode. Um, and <clears throat> it's kind of an oddball resolution. It's kind of halfway between CGA and MDA for uh, people who are uh, familiar with early PC stuff. Um, it's an 8 by 10 uh, character cell instead of 8x8 for CGA or 9x11 for, for MDA. So reasonably sharp text and uh, higher resolution um, graphics than CGA offered. 640x240, um, 640 um, all points addressable. It was, a, it was a full frame buffer. In fact, it was only a frame buffer. They used a custom CRT controller of their own design 
um, instead of a, a 6845 or whatever it was that uh, IBM used. And uh, <clears throat> they also used, uh, in that boot ROM, they had a video driver which was capable of, of drawing characters on this graphics screen so it could, it could easily emulate a text mode. It did so reasonably fast. It would not have uh, excited a TRS-80 Model 3 owner, but uh, it was perfectly acceptable by the, uh, the standards of S100 bus machines of the day. And of course the machine was quite fast, uh, it just was kind of slow drawing text because it was having to do so on a fully graphic screen. Uh, it had uh, six expansion ports on the back, um, and uh, a switch mode power supply, and about a half switch mode power supply. The, the main rails were, uh, the plus 5 and plus 12 volt rails were switched, and uh, all the other miscellaneous voltages were just done by a, a linear supply. Um, North Star did a lot of work to fully integrate this machine. So a lot of things that you could not have done if this was not all in one box, they did. So, for example, uh, the, in order to reduce noise on the video screen, they actually tied the uh, um, power supply switching circuit to the horizontal sink of the video. So, the power supply was actually locked to the raster on the, on the video screen so that they wouldn't interfere, interfere with each other. Um, another example is if uh, if this machine wasn't fully integrated, they wouldn't have been able to use one auxiliary processor to deal with both the keyboard and the system beep and uh, the floppy. Um, <clears throat> the floppy is a uh, 360K. It's actually it's not an IBM format. It's a hard sector 35 track format, but full 360K, which IBM did not have initially. Uh, the first PC is actually shipped with single sided drives, so that was 180K. Additionally, oh, and this is a standard uh, sugar type drive. Um, just the controller is funky. Um, and then up top on this machine, this has a uh, ST506 type hard disk. Um, this was available from the factory with with a hard disk built in, which the PC was not. Um, it had uh, just one expansion card, and and the way you went, their software fully supported hard disks from the beginning. Um, it initially was called a, an HD5, which was a 5 megabit, probably probably an ST506 would be my guess. Um, and they, they later expanded that to a 15, and I later expanded this one to a 20, because I happened to have a 20 meg uh, Seagate, I forget what it was, ST412 or something like that, that was, or 224, which was just uh, kicking around, so I put that in so I could have myself a little bit more space. Um, and uh, <laughs> like all machines of this era, uh, a hard disk model was, was a deafening experience from, uh, from seated position working on this machine. I happened to have a sound meter and I checked it earlier. This is 60 decibels when a, a normal machine would be 25 or so. So it, it's quite loud, but no more loud than uh, other machines of its day. Um, the cabinetry was also special. This is a, a structural foam cabinet. So it's a, it feels like a very high quality textured plastic on the outside, and it's quite thick, um, and it's quite sturdy. In fact, it, it may have been this machine, which when it was coming back from service one day, my grandfather watched it tumble off the baggage cart at the airport while he was waiting to pick it up. And uh, it came through just fine. It's working just fine. In fact, the, uh, um, the only failure this had was the original hard disk, and I believe that was nothing to do with it getting bounced around and, and more to do with the fact that it was a mini scribe. But uh, anyway, this machine is still working pretty much perfectly, and uh, I'm going to show you in another video um, some of the software and stuff that I have for it and go into uh, perhaps a little bit more detail about the video, which is a fairly interesting part of this machine. Um, and uh, 
hopefully I'll uh, get to a third part where we can go over um, maybe tearing it down and show you what's inside it. Even though this machine looks very much like a TRS-80 Model 3, um, it is nothing to do with one inside. It's uh, engineered completely differently, and it's uh, engineered fairly differently from uh, many machines of its day. I think it's, uh, I think it's worth going through. Um, and uh, we'll get to that in a little while.